he was dying. The freezing water sapping his strength. He pounded his fist against the freezing ice, his lungs beginning to burn. Somewhere, a siren was singing like a harbinger that was fast approaching death. He opened his mouth to scream, the siren pounding through his panic-stricken mind. Ice fluid filled his mouth, burning his lungs as he was ejected unceremoniously onto the cold steel floor, coughing and hacking as the hypersleep fluid drained away through the steel grating. The dream hadn't been real, but sirens still blurred all about him. Slowly he climbed to his feet, wiping the noxious fluid from his arms and chest as he learned to breathe once again. Still shaking, he, he didn't bother to dress, but staggered naked into the crew corridor, heading for the flight deck. Suddenly a woman appeared before him, a light blue aura surrounding her body. Sorry to wake you, sir, but I have a high level 5 emergency. <laughs> Where's the captain? Regulation state, she droned, that the captain should not be awakened for anything less than a level 3 emergency per Drake Corps regulations. Fucking Drake Corps, he muttered. Your objection has been noted and sent to the Drake Corps administration, she announced. Remind me to deprogram you at some point, he said, walking straight through her. Any interference with Drake Corporation technology, she droned, following on behind him, will be classed as espionage and will be dealt with to the full extent of the law. I can't give a tin shit, he muttered, hitting the button to the vacuum door that led to the bridge. Before dropping himself down unceremoniously before the nearest console. Turn off the sirens, for Christ's sake. Let's see what's going on here. The ship's AI did as she was bid, and the ship fell into blessed silence while he checked the sensors for any kind of disturbance or unusual anomaly. There was a sudden blip on the screen, and his eyes narrowed. He checked all interstellar band waves, and there it was a distress beacon. Life Pod 6350 2, point of origin G1226, Ice Planet, Eurydias. Jenna, he turned to the still flickering ship's AI. How far are we out from our destination? We are one Earth week away from G1226, designated Eurydias Ice Planet mining colony. Harvested minerals include. Okay, okay, he cut her off. Didn't ask for a goddamn lecture on the place, just. Deploy the grappling hooks, drag that life pod on board. Begin decontamination process. Negative, she replied. Authorization for such procedures must come from Captain Mercer or Lieutenant Harrigan. Fine, he growled. Wake up the captain, then. For once, she didn't argue. Cryosleep procedures for awakening Captain Mercer are now in place. Peachy, he muttered, climbing to his feet and heading for the door. Mercifully, the ship's AI turned its human masquerade off, but Trayton could almost feel its eyes dogging his every step. After popping into the crew deck, he threw on a flight suit and headed down to the cryotubes. Captain Mercer was already up and dressed, shaking off the hypersleep like the seasoned professional he was. Flight Officer Trayton, he nodded to the other man's approach. Jenna's already informed me of the situation. I instructed her to start waking the rest of the crew. Go to the bridge, you have my authorization to use a grappling hook and bring the life pod on board. Put in the dock in Bay 3. I'll meet you there once the rest of the crew is orientated. Sure thing, Captain. Trayton said, resisting the urge to salute. This wasn't a military vessel, although Drake Corps had added a last-minute consignment of 20 security personnel to the intrepid after communication with the mining colony on Eurydice had gone dark. Thirty minutes later, after a smooth retrieval, Trayton stood in Cargo Bay 3. The bay was a small one of its kind. The Intrepid herself was no more than an interstellar scout ship, military class C, bought and refurbished by Drake Corps to visit their off-world colonies. Not for the executives, of course. The big boys traveled in style. This kind of vessel was for grunt work, repairs and parts all the way. In this case, the boys back on Earth had decided there was a serious malfunction in communications, probably caused by solar winds or geomatic storms. But after two weeks with no communication from Eurydice, the company had been forced to send an appraisal vessel to see what the hell was going on. The journey with current tech had been around three years, a marvel only made possible by technology given to the human race by the Kentorian Empire in exchange for nothing more than water. 
Not gold or silver, but simple water, of which the planet had an abundance. This exchange had, in a matter of months, advanced human technology to heights only dreamed of in works of science fiction. So what if a few million people died of famine and thirst? The big corporations had got what they wanted. And who do you think was at the forefront of developing these new technological marvels? Who else but Drake Corps, leading the world in interstellar exploration? More like exploitation, Drayton muttered, where he stood next to the captain, lost in thought. You say something, Dray? the captain said. Standing patiently as Jenna scanned the life pod for any signs of damage. She's intact, Captain. The blue hologram flickered into life in front of them. One passenger aboard critically injured but stable. The lifeboat's auto dock is working on the passenger, one Joseph Highland, rank minor engineer and marine diver second class. Injuries consist of four shattered ribs, one punctured lung, multiple cuts and abrasions, scalp lacerations, cracked skull, one broken ankle, current state, medically induced coma. Holy shit. What the hell happened to him? Drayton said, shifting uncomfortably. I don't know, a meat grinder or something? The captain ignored him. How long until he's conscious, Jenna? Estimation with current ongoing procedures, one standard Earth week, she replied. And if we move him to sickbay? Not recommended, she replied. Any movement at this stage could kill the patient. Recommend we let the auto doc continue treatment until the patient is more stable. Understood, the captain nodded before turning to Drayton. Lieutenant, go get the food recycler online. The crew will be hungry after their journey. Go take a shower, Trey. You smell like a cryo tube. Yeah, you got it, Captain. Oh, and good work, Lieutenant. Mercer called after him, but he was already gone. Happy to offload the heavy work to the higher ups. Trey probably stayed in the hydro shower longer than he should have, but today's shower water was tomorrow's coffee, so who cares? Besides, dried on cryo jelly was a bitch to remove. By the time he left the steaming bathroom, his skin felt tender and raw. He shrugged into a fresh flight suit and strapped on his boots. Luckily, his officer rank had given him the privilege of a private room. It wasn't very big or comfortable, not on a rig like this, but it was better than sharing four to a room like the rest of the crew. Giving himself a cursory glance at the mirror, he headed down to deck two in the mess hall. Like everything else on the ship, the mess hall wasn't very large. All white walls, metal bench-like tables, and the humming recyclers. Most of the ten-man crew sat at the dining table, whilst the Drake Corps security unit sat a little apart. All except for their sergeant major, who seemed to be in some kind of heated discussion with Captain Mercer. The sergeant was a big man, wide at the shoulders and narrow at the hips. The guy looked like he could drink boiling water and piss out ice cubes. Still, if Mercer was intimidated by the bigger man, it didn't show. He shook his head for the third time and walked over to Trey, who was now standing by the recyc machine, leaving the sergeant red-faced and sweating. What you having, Trayton? The captain said, drawing closer. The meat-tasting goo or the fruit-flavored goo? I, uh, thought I'd mix them together, Trey laughed. You're a sick fuck, Trayton, the captain smiled. But to Trey, that smile seemed strained around the edges. You mind me asking what all that was about? Trey asked nodding towards the furious sergeant who had now sat back down and was talking to his men in hushed conspiratory tones. Uh, he didn't agree with my decision to not approach the planet until we can revive the newest member of our crew. Son of a bitch told me to open the auto dock to fill the poor bastard with stems force him to talk. And when I tell him that would probably kill the guy, he shrugged and called it collateral damage. What'd you expect? Trey shrugged. Compassion from Dracor? You know who we work for. Like we have a choice, the captain said, pouring himself a cup of brown sludge that passed for coffee. All their competitors been driven under, consumed by the company. You want to work in this business, you work for the corporation. Yeah, Trayton said, following Mercer back to the crew table. Drake Corps is building a brighter future for the off-world colonies. Talking of a brighter future, Mercer said, grimacing at the taste of his coffee. He had just been promoted to my second in command. Trey looked at him, his fork halfway to his mouth. What? Why? What about Lieutenant Harrigan? Cryo tube failure. She isn't. What? No, Captain replied. She's stuck in stasis. Cryo tubes, reporting medical difficulties, whatever that means. 
So the damn thing won't open till we get back to Earth. That means you get a field promotion, pal. Congratulations. Trey grinned. Those talking heads at the corporation will be foaming at the mouth when they realize they still have to pay your salary. Plus, it takes a nice little nap. Not to mention your own pay increase, of course. The captain grinned back at him. I'll drink to that. Trayton laughed, raising his cup. Mercer looked despairingly at the black grunge in his coffee cup. With balls like that, Trayton, looks like I chose the right man for the job. The next week was a flurry of activities, under mounting pressure from the exacts back home, and, of course, the ever-present Sergeant Major. The captain was forced to slowly approach the still-silent colony until they lay in orbit just above the planet's surface. The live pod, which had been removed from Cargo Bay 3, was now in the medical bay waiting for the auto dock to finish its work. Standing by was Chief Medical Officer Michelle Bryans, Captain Mercer, and of course now second-in-command, First Lieutenant Michael Trayton. Also, the ever-watchful Sergeant Major Dennings. Okay, Doc. Captain Mercer sighed. Auto Doc says the worst of his injury has been repaired and he's unstable. Open her up. I must protest. Brian shook her head angrily. It's not recommended to interrupt a procedure until the patient is entirely healed. I know, Captain sighed, giving the waving Sergeant Major a long, hard look. But we are on a certain amount of pressure here. Your objections will go into the ship's log along with my own. But for now, just open up the goddamn thing, okay? Still seriously pissed, Brian's unhooked the umbilical cord from the PDA on her wrist and jacked into the life pod. Seconds later, there was a whooshing as green-smelling antiseptic gas erupted from the chamber. Instantly, the sergeant major moved forward, leaning over the open pod. Highland, he whispered into the pod. Engineer Highland. Suddenly, a blood-streaked hand shot out from the dispersing mist, grabbing Dennings by the throat. This was followed by an inhuman scream of madness as the man sat up, swinging his free arm at the sergeant major's head. Trey noticed a flash of green as he moved forward to restrain the wild-eyed engineer, but it was too late. Whatever Highland held in his hand connected hard to the side of the sergeant major's head before clattering away across the room. Dennings was down hard, his face bloody as even dazed and injured he scrambled for his sidearm, but the captain, seemingly unfazed by the commotion, came forward, pinned the sergeant major's flailing arm in place with one heavy booted foot. Give him a sedative or something, Trayton yelled at the medical officer, who immediately grabbed up a gleaming needle and rammed it into the still screaming man's neck. Whatever was in that needle hit him hard and he immediately sank back into unconsciousness from behind Trey. The commotion was still going on as Dennings had now managed to regain his feet and stood nose to nose with Captain Mercer. Don't you ever put your hands on me again, Dennings screamed in the captain's face, and don't you try to draw your weapon on my fucking medical bay. Mercer shot back just as angry. What were you planning to do? Shoot our patient? Lose the information you've been busting my ass to get? Drayton, who had been desperately searching the corner of the room, suddenly found what he was looking for and used it to bang on the ship's hull loudly. Both men span about, their argument put on hold as Drayton tossed the green rock to Dennings, who snatched it nimbly from the air. You know what that is, Dennings? Drayton asked. He didn't wait for a reply. It's jadeite. It goes for roughly three million converted US dollars per carat. It actually grows just like a pearl in those crazy clam-like creatures down on the planet's surface. Of course, that's not all the corporation's interested in. He was waffling now, trying to give both men time to cool off. There's also lithium down there, and of course, the big-time rhodium itself, which of course we use to help us with interstellar travel. No, the sergeant major said, holding the jadeite up to the light. Real question is, what the hell are these markings? Everyone in the room followed his gaze. Inscribed upon the jadeite were a number of strange markings that almost seemed to shift and undulate in the stark whiteness of the overhead lights. After some convincing, Dennings gave up the stone to Captain Mercer, but only after Mercer had promised to report the findings to Drake Corp immediately. A message has been sent, he nodded to Dennings, but it'll take some time to receive a reply. Some kind of interference coming from the planet's surface. This seemed to mollify the sergeant major somewhat, who stood up immediately after the last stitch was sutured into place. I want that man awake and coherent, he said to Bryans, 
who was now clearing away her bloody instruments. She ignored the looming man, but turned questioningly to the captain, who nodded thoughtfully. Do it, Brian's, but keep him under sedative. There's a good chance we won't be learning anything. He could be in a severe state of shock, or his mind could be completely broken. I understand, Mercer replied, and I will take full responsibility and I'll wake him up. Brian's nodded and began mixing a cocktail of drugs before gently injecting the sleeping man. At first, nothing seemed to happen, but then the man's eyes started to flutter and his breathing evened out. Slowly, he opened his eyes, letting out a long, painful groan. Dennings tried to move forward, but the captain was already there. Highland. Joseph Highland, can you hear me? Again, the man groaned. Can you hear me, Joseph? What happened down there? In the deep, the man muttered. In the dark. What, Joseph? The captain asked eagerly. What happened down there in the deep? The man muttered again, drool spilling over his slack lips. In the temple. Temple? Mercer asked, looking at the others. The hell's he talking about? Maybe we should show him the stone. Trading interjected. I mean, he had it with him. Maybe, maybe it could be. Maybe it could jog his memory or something. Worth a shot, I suppose. Mercer said, not taking his eyes from the semi-conscious man. It's in my quarters. Go fetch it, Lieutenant. Trey did as he was bid, quickly heading to the captain's quarters, and scooping up the strange stone and hurrying back. Still, his eyes were drawn to the markings as he handed the stone back to his captain. You see this, Joseph? You recognize it? Mercer said, holding it up before the other man's face. Suddenly, his swimming eyes came into terrible focus, and he began to pour forth scream after nerve-shattering scream, twisting his head back and forth. Blood began to gush from his nose, spattering the captain's startled face. He drew back with a cry. Brian's came forward, needle in hand, but it was already too late. Highland, his face now spattered with his own blood, issued one last desperate scream, his eyes bulging before he lay still. Head slumped to one side bloody froth seeping from between his lifeless lips. Brian's dropped the needle, shattering it upon the floor as she rushed over, feeling for a pulse. There was nothing. Dead, she whispered. Do something! Dennings roared. Look! She shot back at him angrily, pointing at the blood trickling from the dead man's ears. Something ruptured inside. There's nothing more we could do for him! Perform an autopsy, Brian's, the captain said, wiping the blood from his face. Start an autopsy immediately. I want the results on my desk first thing in the morning. Sure thing, Captain, she replied. And where are you going? The captain said to Dennings, who was already leaving the room. I'm going to make my report, the sergeant major replied. We're going in, Mercer. I can guarantee you that. After this clusterfuck, we are going in. Two hours later, while the rest of the crew was sleeping, Trey was down in the tech lab running an analysis on the strange markings found upon the stone. So far, the database had come back with zero results of any kind of known language or hieroglyphic markings, both on-world and off. If only he had access to the Kentorian Empire's database. The Kentorians had hinted at other sentient life out there in the Big Black, but as soon as their dealings with mankind were finished, they had disappeared back to their homeworld of which they had not bothered to divulge, with promises to one day return. Since then, there had been no more communication with this seemingly secretive alien empire. Frustrated and tired, Trayton closed off the diagnostic machines and headed for his bunk, but sleep was a long time in the coming. Early the next morning, Trey was summoned to a crew meeting in the mess hall. Everyone on board was present, except for the Drape Corporation security team who was notably absent. Okay, now here's a lowdown, Captain said, standing to address his crew. As for 6 a.m. this morning, I was personally informed by the big wigs back at that Sergeant Major Dennings has been given a field promotion and now holds the rank of commander. Furthermore, although I am still technically in charge of the ship, Commander Dennings has now been placed in charge of this operation. C c can they do that? One of the crew spoke up. They can do what they please. Trey interjected. It's their ship. We're on their payroll. Okay, okay, settle down. 
The captain raised a supplicating hand to silence the angry murmuring. Like the lieutenant said, it's their fairground. You just operate the rides. I expect this crew to do its duty, but remember, when it comes to the safety of this ship and its crew, I'm still in charge. It sounded good in his own ears, but even he doubted the viability of that statement. Okay. Now listen up, people. I want two engineers down in the hangar bag, one to prepare two drop ships. You have two hours for the departure. The rest of you prepare the ship for a long, sustained orbit above the planet. Move it. They ain't paying us by the hour. You stay with me, he barked at Trey, who was getting up to file out of the rest of the crew. Take a seat, he told Trey, who sat back down just as the last of the crew filed out. What's on your mind, Captain? Remember checking the ship's manifest before we left Earth? Yeah, sure, Captain. You, me, and Harrigan all checked the cargo listing before taking off, as dictated by the company policy. Yeah, yeah. Did you happen to see a rather large stash of weapons on that listing? The captain continued. Uh, hell no, Trayton replied. Just standard sidearms for the officers, a couple light SMGs in the armory in case of emergencies. So tell me, Trayton. And why, when I went down to the cargo bay, did I find Denning's security team kitted up like they were about to enter a fucking war zone? Y you're shitting me, Trayton said, his mouth hanging open. Not at all, good buddy, not at all. They had military carbines, full body armor, respirators, whole shebang. And when I dared to question the new commander on the whole shit show, you know what he said to me? He continued, not waiting for a reply. He told me to mind my own business and prepare to land on the planet. Hell, I think he's about two steps away from having a couple of his goons drag me out of there. So what the hell are we going to do about this? Trey asked angrily. The captain shrugged. Not much we can do. Happy asshole is now in charge, so we're going to take him down to the planet and let him sort this whole debacle. Then, then once we leave and we get back home, I give those Drake Corporation assholes my stripes. Get off this merry-go-round once and for all. Two hours later, both men were stood in the hangar bay, waiting for the pilots of two dropships to run over their final checks. Dennings' now heavily armored security team had already entered the ships and were strapped in place, waiting to dust off. What do you mean, a representative of the ship? Captain Mercer spat into the now smiling face of Commander Dennings. I think it's something to do with an insurance issue, Dennings continued to smile. Either way, the company says an officer from the ship must accompany us down to the planet's surface. Obviously, you being the captain and your second lieutenant, Harrigan, being indisposed for the foreseeable future, neither of you can accompany us. This leaves second lieutenant Trayton here, he said, his smile growing broader. The captain sighed, his shoulders slumping. Looks like you're it, Trayton. I don't like it, but it seems like we ain't, we ain't being left with much of a choice. That's right, Captain. You really don't. Dennings replied. If you please, Lieutenant, he said, waving Trayton towards the waiting ship. Oh, and I will be taking that, he said, pointing towards Trayton's sidearm, which he had strapped on this morning for some reason. In the light of recent events, it gave him a kind of cold comfort. There was no way he was giving it up to these corporate thugs without a fight. I don't think so he said, taking a step back from Denning's reaching hand. You guys are packing enough firepower to overrun a small city, and from what we saw in the medical lab, I think we can count out a little communication error or faulty wiring down there. So if you want me to come with you quietly and my full cooperation down there on the surface, then I stay armed. Denning's thought it over. You at least proficient with that thing? Trayton grinned. Won't you stand up against the wall, Commander? Put an apple on your head. We can see what happens. You threatening a commanding officer, Trayton? Not at all, Trey replied. Just a little humor, Commander. Just a little humor. Get on board, Lieutenant. Take a seat. Still smiling, Trayton boarded the ship. We'll be in constant communication from the planet's surface. Dennings turned back to the captain. I want constant surveillance on my squad from the bridge. I intend to have this issue resolved with the utmost haste, but until then, you watch your ass, Captain. You understand? Absolutely, Mercer replied, his face carefully neutral. Denning staring into the other man's face for a second or two longer, then turned and boarded the ship. 
From the bridge, Captain Mercer watched the two dropships dust off and approach the swirling atmosphere of Eurydice. For some reason, he had a sudden urge of foreboding, and a cold sweat broke out all over his body as the two ships disappeared into Eurydice's frozen heart. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for listening to tonight's podcast, if you're listening on Spotify, and thank you guys for doing that thing where you subscribe, where you hit the bell, where you hit like, or you leave a little comment at the bottom, or wherever you can leave comments at, I don't know, I don't use Spotify that much. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough, I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um organized for my own life and patreon subscribers you guys who subscribe everywhere th this this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters so i want to give a very special thank you to jordan humble diana kraus disciple strategy wolf emoji sully man brandon mendoza brimstone pandemonium kaltuna william wellington scruffy the janitor brenna crow lakeda canizales smiley the psychotic jenna Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primarch, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. 